السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى the one who created us, the one who is in control of every aspect of our lives, our existence, the one whom we shall return to, the one who has blessed us in a million and one ways. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he who was chosen to be sent to us as a messenger and a guide. We ask Allah to bless his entire household, his entire group of companions and at the same time we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us and grant us goodness. My beloved mothers and sisters in Islam, indeed every one of us is gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one way or another and sometimes in fact in many ways but we don't realize the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because human nature is such that we concentrate on those things that we don't have. This is what happens to mankind. We tend to concentrate on what we don't have. And this is why we overlook what we actually do have. They say you only realize the value of what you had after you lose it. But that should not be the case when it comes to a believing male or female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to sit and ponder over his gifts, to think about what he's given you. And he says, I'm going to ask you about what I've given you. I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, would know a verse of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, then definitely you will be all asked about the gifts that Allah has bestowed upon you. Everyone is going to be asked. So what are these gifts? You need to sit and ponder, think about them. There are gifts within you. There are gifts around you. There are gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in existence, in the creation of the skies, the heavens, the earth, the plantation, the atmosphere and everything around you as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you were to look into your own selves and what we've bestowed upon you, you would understand the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He calls on us by saying, And within your own selves, do you not see? Are you not able to look? My mothers and sisters, I ask you to ponder for a moment. Don't we have eyes, mashallah? For those who might not be able to see, don't you have a nose you can breathe? Don't you have, mashallah, a brain, a mind? Alhamdulillah. Don't you have feet, legs, hands, fingers, and so on? Haven't you been blessed with so much? If Allah has taken one thing away, that's your test. But he's given you so many other things. Subhanallah. If you've had one thing taken away, automatically there are other things that are given to you in a bigger way. Those who cannot see can hear better than those who can see in most cases. And this is a gift of Allah. And Allah has done this in order for us to be able to appreciate. Now one might ask, I'm supposed to be speaking about daughters. Where am I heading? <laughs> to be honest, the gifts of Allah are such that when a person is married, and I'm going to start at that point and I'll probably end at that point. So we will close the entire circle. When a person gets married, one of the things that he or she looks forward to after the honeymoon, inshallah, is to have children. And one of the biggest tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the following. And before I say it, let me tell you, when you understand that Allah has chosen for you a specific package of tests that is uniquely yours, not anyone else's, he knows that he issues sabr and patience according 
to the package that he's given you to you you can never be burdened with something beyond what you can cope with because Allah has promised that he will give out to you the amount of sabr and patience that you actually need for your package that he already knows about so don't say I can't cope yes it gets to a level where perhaps you might want to do something about it. You know, people think that when we speak about marriage, you need to stay in an oppressive marriage because Allah says he won't burden you with something that you cannot cope with. That doesn't mean you need to remain in an oppressive marriage. All it means is when it gets to beyond a certain point, you can choose another way out that Allah has allowed you to. That's what it means. You can. So let's not misinterpret what is being said. But what I mean is when there are things you have no control over at all, there is no way Allah will open your door of sabr according to your problem, according to your issue. You lose a loved one, for example. Or the main issue that I wanted to start with is, and I said, one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest tests that Allah tests a couple with is when they do not have offspring. When they don't have offspring. That is your paradise. That is your jannah. Allah says, hang on. I know exactly why I am not giving you offspring. You might not know. I know why I'm not giving you. And I'm telling you, this is the biggest test for you. And if you were to bear sabr, I want to let you know that I will be with you. My help is with you. And at the same time, for you is Jannah. إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Indeed, Allah compensates those who have engaged in any form of sabr, unlimited reward, in an unlimited manner. Allah gives you so much. So my mothers and sisters, if from amongst you, there will definitely be people who don't have children and you desperately want those children. And yes, it is correct. Allah will keep you there for as long as he wills. And he may grant you a miracle according to what you perceive is a miracle. And if you don't get what you perceive is a miracle, you need to know that what he has done for you is always a miracle. You need to know this. When Allah doesn't give you what you want, you need to know he's always done whatever he wanted. That was the miracle for you. You may not understand it. I know of people who've had children after a long, long time and then they lost their children to a motor vehicle accident. And I remember being told, I wish I didn't have these children in the first place. Well, when you didn't have them, you continued to cry about it. Well, there is no harm. You are supposed to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he tests you with not giving you what you want. It's, think about what I've just said. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given you what you want, one of the reasons is he wants you to draw closer to him by calling out to him alone. That's what it is. If every one of us had whatever we wanted, I think a lot of us would not even be reaching out, calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think we would be dilly-dallying in our acts of worship. But when you have a problem, it's a medical issue, it's a social issue, it's a financial issue, whatever issue it may be. You start calling out to Allah, your heart becomes softened. It should become softened. And this is why I say, and I'm repeating, if you don't have children, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon this, the many things that you do have and continue asking. I'm not saying sit back and say, look, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to do anything. I don't want to seek perhaps medical advice. I don't want to see if there's anything wrong. I don't want and I'm just going to sit because I'm a mu'mina and I've been told that you just need to be happy with the decree of Allah. That is a warped understanding of taqdeer, of predestiny. Warped. Allah says, do whatever is in your capacity to, to achieve what is beneficial for you according to you. Make sure that you go the extra mile to do that which you believe is beneficial for you. Then, seek the help of Allah and don't be lazy. And then when something happens to you, the hadith says, وَإِنْ أَصَابَكَ شَيْءٍ لَا تَقُلْ لَوْ أَنِّي فَعَلْتُ كَانَ كَذَا وَكَذَا فَإِنَّ لَوْ تَفْتَحُ بَابَ الشَّيْطَانِ when something finally does happen, 
this way or that way. Don't ever go back to blame the term if, if. If I did this, had I done this, this would have happened. If I did this, that would have happened. Don't say that because the if opens the door of the devil. That's what it means. You did it and that's it. I tried my best. I continued making dua, but I'm happy upon what Allah has chosen for me. That's something that I need to understand. So those who don't have children, may Allah bless you with children. Those who don't have offspring, may Allah bless you with offspring. Then mashallah, we are blessed. Mashallah. And what happens? Five years later, eight years later, ten years later, I know of a case 18 years later, mashallah, when people almost lost hope and Allah says, hey, I'm going to give you something. And suddenly you're expecting and suddenly you have a child and suddenly it's a boy or it's a girl. And mashallah, we're so excited. Life changes and everything becomes so exciting. That's the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isn't it? At the same time, my mothers and sisters, there is another way Allah tests. And what is that? By giving you another child. Oh, so how is that a test of the same gender? Subhanallah. So now there's a new problem. What's the problem? I have a child, but that child is the same gender as the previous one. So oh. <laughs> people are not happy. Allah says in the Quran, amazingly, that he creates as he wishes. Lillahi mulku samawati wal ardi yakhluku ma yasha. Yahabu liman yasha u inatha. Wa yahabu liman yasha u dhukur. Aw yuzawijuhum dhukrana wa inatha. وَيَجْعَلُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ عَقِيمًا Allah, to Him belongs everything on earth and in heaven. For Him is the ownership of what is in the skies and on earth. He creates as He wishes. He gives whomsoever He wishes, only females. And He gives whomsoever He wishes, only males. And he gives whomsoever he wishes, both male and female. And for some whom he desires not to give offspring, he will give neither male nor female. That's Allah. That's his plan. So you have one child, you are happy. You have another child, if it's the same gender, you are sad. That's what happens. That is the test of Allah. Do not be sad. I want to inform you of a major sin. A major sin is to become upset at the gender of the child that you have been bestowed with. Especially if it is a female. Why especially if it is a female? Because that is expressly mentioned in the Quran. The kuffar at the time of the Prophet wasallam, just the pre-Islamic era, those kuffar, they had a major issue. What was the issue? They only wanted males. I think this is creeping in to society today again. And it has been rearing its ugly head now and again. People only want males. Female, in some countries they will abort. The moment they find out it's a female. Because they become upset. And for this reason, many verses have been revealed. Take a look at Surat. Kuwirat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of how those who used to bury their daughters alive, there was a pagan habit that as soon as a child was born, at that time there was no ultrasound to figure it out, otherwise they would have dealt with it earlier. As soon as they figured out or they saw the child is born female, the father would take the child, dig a pit, bury the child alive, forget about it and carry on. What happens to the child? I'm not bothered. I don't want a female. That's how bad it was. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent, he made it clear that daughters are special. Very clear. He made it very clear that if you get upset when you are informed of the fact that Allah's bestowed you with the gift of a child being a female, then you've engaged in a major sin just by becoming upset. So be careful. 
Allah says, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ قُتِلَتْ When the girl child who was buried alive will be asked on that day of judgment, why, what was the sin for which you were killed? Who will have to reply? Those who killed her. So this is a beautiful teaching. One might say, how does it apply to us? We don't kill our children. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about something even more interesting regarding the kuffar. وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنثَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ يَتَوَارَى مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ when one of them was informed of a female child, he would hide his head. In fact, he would become upset. His face would become blackened. And he would become angry when he was informed of a female child. He would hide from community and from people because of the evil news that he got. So from this we learn that if you are a believer, male or female, you will not consider it evil news. It's a blessing. Every man out there who is successful in one way or another, who has been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one way or another, has come to the earth through a female, subhanallah, has been looked after and nurtured by a female, the same female that we are speaking about here, that those people used to get upset when they were informed, you have a female child. Imagine if all of the females were eradicated. To begin with, I wouldn't be talking here. But at the same time, it would create disaster. Allah alone knows why He does what He does. So be happy when you have been told, you know what? You've only got females. So, in order to put an end to this pagan belief, so many rules and regulations came into play. One of them was the manifestation of the mercy of Allah when you've been given the gift of a daughter. Why is she, is she so special? Well, let me tell you. She was downtrodden at one stage. She was looked down upon in the pre-Islamic era. She was made to perform nude in the presence of those who had wealth. This was at the time of the pre-Islamic age. She was treated like a commodity to be bought and sold. Life was imposed on her in terms of decision. Where you get married and what you do, it wasn't even necessarily marriage. It was abuse at times. So what Islam did is, it came in and governed and started saying, Amazingly and uniquely, you shall not treat your girl child like this. Starting from the news that she's a girl child, you need to be happy. Thank Allah. Alhamdulillah. Oh Allah, you have, you have granted us barakah in our home. You have granted us blessing in our home. That's the girl child, subhanAllah. A blessing. What a big blessing. She will come with her own sustenance. She has come with her own destiny. And on top of that, she has come as a means of entry into paradise for those who take care of her. Subhanallah. She has come as a means of entry to paradise for those who take care of her. So Islam says it is prohibited to make a woman parade nude for the men. Prohibited. Let her cover herself so that she is respected. She is not judged based on whether she has thick hair or sparse hair or for, for example, maybe a receding hairline. She's not judged because of that. She's not judged because she weighs 40 kilos or 60. She is not judged because she is tall or short. She is not judged by the fact that she might be dark in complexion or fair. She is not judged by the fact that she may have not been, for example, of the size of feet that someone decided was ideal. 
I was shocked to know that in some cultures, if you have a certain size of foot, they don't want to marry you. F too big lah. Have you heard that? <laughs> cannot marry, cannot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It is a reality. Islam says this is pagan. You cannot do that. You judge her by her dedication to Allah. And we will get to this in a few moments. And when I say you judge her by her dedication to Allah, meaning when you want to get married or for example, there is reason to say, I'd like to know how this person is. You know, people say, don't judge me. Yes, we understand. I also believe we shouldn't be judging people with the wrong judgments for the wrong reasons unnecessarily. But we're allowed to guide and advise, aren't we? So let's not hide behind the statement, don't judge me in order to run away from advice that we know. But at the same time here, we're talking about something else. We're talking about a totally different type of a judgment. When you want to get married, it is your right to have looked at the person you want to marry, to have perhaps spoken to them. That is also your right. You may choose to do that. You may choose to want to know that you're making a right decision. Nobody can take that away from you. They cannot just decide to say, you know what? That's it. You're not going to see him. When you get married, you're going to see him. Some cultures to this day happen to do that and they call it Islam. And we are here to clarify that that is not Islam. That is not Islam. You are allowed to meet. You are allowed to have a say. You can say, no, I don't want. I'm not happy. I don't feel comfortable. And you know what? Yes, you do have that final say. Subhanallah. So when... Rasulullah sallallahu made it clear that you will not inherit a female because she's a human being. She used to be inherited. A man dies and suddenly those whom he owes money, they come and say, okay, where's the money? No money. Okay, I'll take this girl and I'll take that woman. How can you say that? She's not a commodity. Prohibited. What greatness in teaching. Amazing. So she will only... Be judged based on her dedication to Allah, her service to humanity. And humanity is known as? You know, you have Allah and Al-Ibad. They talk of Hukukullah, which means the rights of Allah, and Hukukul Ibad, the rights of fellow worshippers, the rest of humanity, for example. So those who dedicatedly fulfill the rights of fellow worshippers, they have actually fulfilled their duty unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember speaking about fulfilling the rights of worshippers and I said we need to serve humanity. And someone actually got up and told me we only serve Allah. We don't serve humanity. I said think about it. When Allah has asked you to serve humanity, you are actually yes serving Allah. But through the service of the rest of mankind. We are not saying worship mankind. No, there is a difference. We are saying serve the creatures of Allah. There is a very big difference between the two. Worship is only for Allah. We agree. No act of worship shall be rendered to any but Allah. But when it comes to the rest of mankind and the rest of the creatures of Allah, there are certain rules, regulations, certain requirements. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to fulfill the rights of everything. Part of your test, fulfill the rights. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited the burial of this girl, her treat, her maltreatment. On top of that, there was something amazing that happened. What was it? Instead of only prohibiting that a woman be inherited herself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictated that she will be given from the estate of her deceased relatives, if they're close enough, such as a father, or a son and so on she will be given the men might have asked what does she need that for she's taken care of all her needs are taken care of because truly according to the Islamic rulings a female is definitely special a daughter is so special she is not supposed to be Worrying about her food, clothing and accommodation, it is supposed to be taken care of by right. I know one might argue that, oh, the world has changed and things have become so difficult and so on. Still, it is the right of the males 
from an Islamic perspective. It is still the right of the male. Yes, if you want to help, you want to work because you know life is tough. We want to live on a higher level than we actually may if I don't work. It happens sometimes. Your husband might be able to afford. Your father might be able to afford. Your brother who may be looking after you may be able to afford. But his affordability may be on a level that you might want to perhaps do better. And you might want to actually raise so what would have to happen? Maybe if you've chosen to work within a decent environment that would not be in the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no harm, you've actually now brought in an income in order to be over and above the minimum that was due to you. The standard of living sometimes, people are not satisfied with. They say, no, I can do better. You know, it reminds me of so much in terms of technology. We follow it such that we are not satisfied with what we have which was the latest last year, but is no longer the latest this year. So, you got your cash, you may go ahead. Don't become a slave of technology. Don't. Because why? It will actually make you waste a lot of your money. And it will make you waste a lot of your energy, emotions. And it makes you feel so sad, yet you have something so beautiful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. However, a female should have been looked after and still should be looked after regarding her basic necessities. But at the same time, what we do need to know is, Allah says, we will give her a share just for herself. And I remember mentioning this and because we are speaking about how special daughters are, I want to say something very important. When it comes to the laws of inheritance, those who don't know Islam from among the non-Muslims and from among the ignorant Muslims, they pick on the fact that women seemingly get less than men when it comes to inheritance. Don't they say that? They say, look, take a look at this. Islam says, A male will get double the portion of a female. Wow. So they say that's very unfair. Well, I can explain it to you from a very simple perspective today. That in actual fact, even though in figures it might seem that the male has got more, in reality, the female got more. You might say, how? You know, don't try and pull cotton wool over our eyes. No, I'm not. I'll explain to you. A male responsibility extends well beyond himself. Female has a responsibility, even her own upkeep. It's the responsibility of a close male, the closest male. And Allah knows that sometimes when that male happens to be a little bit further, he may not fulfill those rights. So he says, the further the male, the bigger your share. Amazing. So if you have a relative, for example, you have a father who passed away and he left behind, say, for example, 75 million ringgates. Let's make it a bit interesting. Okay. 75 million ringgates and you are there your brother is there and that's it the chances of your brother looking after you are quite big especially if you've been brought up together in a decent home so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dictated that the brother gets 50 million and you get 25 million and here everybody gets up and say that's unfair unfair hang on hang on hang on hang on that 50 million is not exclusively for him, but the 25 million is exclusively yours. That's how special daughters are. 25 million exclusively yours. What do you do with it? Well, it's just exclusively yours for over and above the duty. So what happens with the 50 million? That man, if he's the closest male relative to you, guess what? He owes you food, clothing, accommodation, and basic necessities such as medicine and so on. He needs to look after you. With what? within his 50 million and on top of that he has his own wife to look after and on top of that he has his own daughters and children to look after and on top of that he may be having so many other responsibilities so if you divide the 50 million into the 10 people that he has to look after it's on average 5 million each you are sitting with 25 million and guess what you've just got another five <laughs> simple logic the problem people are blaming Islam because some of the males are running away from that responsibility. That's the reason. So don't blame Islam. It's a perfect system. The problem is we've stopped following it in the way we are supposed to. A mu'min and a mu'mina, 
A true believing male or female should be such that when they believe and they claim to believe, they surrender to what Allah says. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah says, It is not for a believing male or female that when Allah or His Messenger have decided something, they feel they have a choice in that regard. True believing males and females feel we don't have a choice in this regard. Come time for salah, I don't have a choice. I must fulfill. Dress in a specific way, I don't have a choice. I must fulfill. Come to worshipping Allah alone, I don't have a choice. I must fulfill. Abstaining from something prohibited, I don't have a choice. I must abstain. So look at how a female gets more. I can let you in on something even greater. If you are only one female, you are the only daughter, for example. And the rest of the relatives happen to be distant, like you might have an uncle. You know, the deceased man has brothers and sisters, and he has you as a daughter. Guess what? Allah dictates in the Quran that you give her half of the wealth. Whoa. Half of it must go to her, herself. Even if her mother is alive, meaning, even if the wife of that man who passed on is alive. Let's word it that way. The daughter will get half, 50%. Why? Because now the male relatives are a little bit more distant. The chances of them dilly-dallying become a little bit greater. So Allah says, don't worry. It's still his duty, but in case he doesn't, you can go ahead. This is an amount that will cover you by the will of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on top of that, if you were two girls, just two daughters, guess what? You go away with two-thirds, 66.66% of that wealth. That is the biggest share in inheritance. It goes to the females. The biggest share. Nowhere does it say a male will get 66%. Never. It's only for females. Why? Because daughters are special. That's the reason. So special that Allah has dedicated an entire surah in the Quran as Surah to Nisa. Have you ever seen a surah, Surah to Rijal? Surah of the men? There is a whole chapter known as the females, the women. There is no chapter known as the men. And in there, Allah speaks of the treatment of women and how you have to be even more patient with them and how you have to be kind. You have to consider that their emotions are slightly different. You have to make sure that you have taken care of them in a beautiful way because they are special. Surah An-Nisa starts off by making mention of a child who doesn't even have a father. To defend her. Surah An-Nisa starts off by making mention of al yatama Those who are orphans. Those who don't even have a father to defend them. And Allah says, be careful. Do not usurp the wealth of the orphans. وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَمْوَالِكُمْ Don't eat their wealth. Don't mix their wealth with yours. Give them their due. It is theirs. Don't cheat the women out of their share in inheritance. Daughters are special. You know, if a father passes on and he may have left some property, some business, sometimes you find the women don't really know what was going on. So you find male relatives coming in and saying, you know, your father had this and this and this, and they have a huge building in the center of KL, and they come to you and say, that building was one million ringgates. And you say, wow. And you don't know it was actually 100 million. What did they do to you? They robbed you because you didn't know. So Allah warns them to say, hang on, don't rob them. Don't take advantage of the fact that they might be ignorant of what was there. No, you value it correctly. You give it to them correctly. You make sure you give it to them on time. You make sure you look after them. They are special. That is the way you will earn paradise. When Allah completes the verses of inheritance and how it is supposed to be split, you know what He says? He says, whoever is going to fulfill these rules correctly for them will be paradise. These are the limits of Allah. And whomsoever is going to usurp and whomsoever is going to cheat for them, what is more befitting than to be cast into hellfire? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So this is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because daughters are special. If we go beyond the issue of inheritance, and I've explained it to you in a nutshell, 
Let's go to the issue of the dress code and dwell on it for a few moments. Like I said moments ago, we don't want to judge our sisters based on the pressure of the environment and society for them to show what they have when what they have was given by Allah. Your complexion given to you by Allah. Your build given to you by Allah. Your, the type of hair you have given to you by Allah. It is pagan to judge based on that. Totally pagan, unacceptable. So Allah says, in order to give you the honor, we ask you to conceal. That's it. In order to give you the dignity, let's pause. You might argue that, okay, this was a long time ago, before the Islamic period that they did that. I want to tell you, we've come back to the stage today. Perhaps the pressure of society is worse than the pagan time. The reason I say this, at that time they oppressed women with women knowing that they were oppressed. Today they are, they are abusing female in a way that the females look forward to the abuse. That's what it is. They have, when they decided a long time ago, when they saw that we can no longer make use of the nude women to fulfill our lusts and desires to be paraded in front of us, they chose to do something more intelligent. They said to themselves, we will design clothing for them. We will make sure that we make it the in thing by promoting it in the media and by using whether it is movies or adverts or whatever else in order to promote what they are supposed to be doing in such a way that they consider it liberation to remove their clothing. So when they remove their clothing, they are now liberated. I remember in Africa, one of the leaders was commenting about how the world has forced women through, you know, brainwashing them to remove their clothing and consider that liberation. And he said, we in Africa, many years back before the colonialist came in, we used to wear feathers and skins to cover our private parts. And we used to move around with spears and daggers. And here comes the colonialist and tells us that, you know what? This is backward. This is really backward. It's unacceptable. You people are Bushmen. They called us Bushmen. You know? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. They called us Bushmen. And they said, you people are not even clothed. And they came through with beautiful clothing, to be honest, that covered the female and even gave her a Victorian cap, which had a net. Subhanallah. They covered her so beautifully. And now the same African is saying, why? We were liberated. You took away our liberation because according to you now, you have changed everything and you are now going back to where we were by saying you go back and put on the skin and put on the feathers and just cover the front and the back and you are liberated. So we were already there. You took us out of civilization and you brought us into degradation. And now, according to you, you're taking us back to civilization. But that's not the case. It means there is something sinister. It means a brain and a mind that is a thinking mind will actually go and ponder and will say definitely something is wrong here. Something is wrong. Daughters are special. You're not supposed to be nude just for the desires of men. And people say, no, I'm doing it for myself. No, you're not. Cannot be. I'm doing it for myself. No, I tell you why. If you put on two pounds of weight, you will cover. <laughs> Trust me, it's a fact. It shows that you're enslaved, total enslavement. If there is a small blemish on your head, you won't go out. You need something. Make sure, even if it means 30 minutes and it means 300 ringgit, one pimple, worth it, worth it. At least when I go out, there we are. You know? I remember when I first came across this beauty camera, you know, they have a beauty camera, it takes off your, all your blemishes, gone, you know? <laughs> so first came across the beauty camera and I thought to myself, you know, if women, maybe even men, could actually 
move around with a little screen in front of them, just so that when you look, you can just see a filtered image already. They would do so. It might happen one day, subhanAllah, you see little screens walking. That is how enslaved we are. We are embarrassed because of the normal, natural pimples that we have. Do you see? We are embarrassed because of that. Why? Because we are enslaved to a certain extent. It's not bad to look good, subhanAllah. But within the limits, remember, why are you doing it? Allah says, don't do it for the opposite sex because it won't stop. If you do it for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for your spouse, for example, for a good purpose, you know, you want to feel good. You're not going to show it to the world. Perhaps, yes. But if a person is doing it for the opposite sex, it is called tabarruj. Tabarruj meaning you are too special to engage in that. You're not allowed to engage in tabarruj. Tabarruj to show off to other men something that's not even theirs. Make them wish, you know. May Allah forgive us. For what? And like I said, Allah sometimes subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us these beautiful rulings in such a way that if we were to ponder over them, we would realize that it's a gift for other sisters. You might be gorgeous. You might be, mashallah, the most, you know, good looking, so pretty, everything you can show. Wait, wait, look at the others around you. Perhaps you are putting pressure on them. Perhaps you are a reason why their home is breaking because now the men are becoming used to a certain figure that they are being bombarded with all along. Daughters are too special for that. If you want to contribute to building their homes, you need to also dress appropriately. That's a fact. If you may not have understood what I said, let me say it in a different way. Sometimes what happens is, a person who may not be up to the tip-top shape that the world wants to see, would be looking at those who are exposing themselves and burning in her heart to say, Wallahi, she doesn't know what she's doing in my marriage and in my home just by exposing, I don't have that hair, I don't have this, I don't have that. So what does she do? She will go to have an operation in order to change the creation of Allah. She will go because she's dissatisfied, she's not happy. She will go and try and change her shape completely and her face and she will go in for plastic surgery and she will still not be satisfied and she will go in for so much more just because there are a few who are mashallah gifted by Allah but they are showing that all to create a trend and an environment of enslavement of the female that's what it is enslavement take a look at these products that we have in the market beauty products I'm not saying they are bad don't get me wrong you may want to use those that are permissible. Yes, like I said, you have every right to be looking, you know, presentable and good according to you. But why are you doing it? That's the question. That's all. The amount of money being used by people to try and change their complexion, go and Google it, check it, is unacceptable. Why? What is so bad? And this is why Islam has made it clear that your complexion is chosen by Allah. There is no virtue of a person coming from Africa over the one who comes from Arabia and vice versa, except by their closeness to Allah. So my sisters, my daughters, you are too special to be bothered about things that Allah has chosen for you. That having been said, I'm not saying just let yourself go. No. You know, people might say, okay, someone, your husband might say, you've gained 20 kilos in the last two weeks. Well, ever since that straight path talk, I'm not worried anymore. <laughs> That's not what I'm trying to say. Yes, you need to be fit. You might want to, for example, uh, you know, people have asked me, is it wrong to go to the gym? To be honest, let's change the question. Is it wrong to keep fit? No, it's not. You have to. Where you do it, how you do it, what environment you do, bear in mind you're a Muslimah. That's all. Simple. I'm not saying don't have your workout every day, half an hour, one hour. Mashallah, you can work out. You can do whatever, subhanAllah. But where and how and when you do it, remember you're a mu'mina. You're a believing female. You need to consider the fact that would, if I were to die here and now, would Allah be pleased with me? Question. Very simple. 
This is the speciality. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you special by. Now let's get to some beautiful narrations where the Prophet sallallahu once was faced. In fact, let me start off with a hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha where she says, I was seated and a woman came in with two girls, two little daughters, and she begged. She came to ask for something. And I didn't have much besides a date or two, and I gave her two dates, and she didn't eat any from it. She gave one date to one of the children and the other to the other, and she went away. And when the Prophet ﷺ came, I told him about it. And he said, anyone who has been blessed with such girls and looks after them and feeds them, for them will be paradise. Subhanallah. Why? Because daughters are special. Let's go to another hadith. Hadith of Uqba ibn Amir radiallahu an, Narrated in Sunan ibn Majah. And even in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad. The Prophet sallallahu spoke about girls. And he says, whoever has three daughters. Whoever has three daughters. And looks after them. Takes care of them. Bears patience regarding them. Wow. When I read that in the hadith some time back. I used to think, what is it? Bearing patience regarding them. Sabara. You know, bearing patience regarding them firstly means, and to be honest, I've got quite a few daughters, mashallah, myself, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so it means to be happy at the fact that you have the daughters, number one. You get Jannah for that. Number two, to look after them knowing that they don't belong to you. They will be married off to someone one day who will have a greater right over them than you. Number three, to bring them up, to endure, to spend on them, to feed them, to look after them, to be able to nurture them, to try and give them some guidance, to show them the light and so on. And that will happen together with their mother if the mother is there and you should participate in that. A lot of the men, they think, oh, you educate a man, You've educated a man. You educate a woman, you've educated the whole. There you are. Subhanallah. So they tell you, well, it's a woman's job. It's not. It's, it belongs to both of you. Mother and father, equally responsible. One might have more time, perhaps. Sometimes both of them don't have that much. You have to make the time. Those are your children, your responsibility. You have to make the time. That's what it is. So to educate them, to be able to give them good guidance, to be able to be a role model for them. It is wrong for us to think that I have my daughters and I have my children and here we are. Let me just go and say, give them some form of education and I have not participated in their lives. I want my child to read Salah, but I don't read Salah. I want my child to dress appropriately, but I don't. I want my child to read the Quran melodiously, but I haven't made an effort. No. Allah has kept it such that from the child, from the age of infancy, that child will mimic and imitate you, whatever you do. You try and read Quran, the child will try and read Quran. How many little children read the, recite the Quran without being able to actually read? Because they've heard. But with us, it's all about songs and it's all about everything else. And it's all about, you know, the dance floor and what have you. That's what's happening. I'm not saying it's wrong, perhaps. I'm not saying it's wrong to sing a decent nasheed or something that has a good meaning to it and so on within the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. But how can you substitute the Quran with something? That's the thing. You have the Quran, it's right in front of you. You need to understand. So these girls are going to grow up and you're going to be spending on them. It is wrong for you when the child is getting married, like some of the cultures do, they draw up a list. Okay, you need to pay. Pay for what? This was the amount we paid at the hospital when your wife was born. This was the, your fiancé. This, wallahi, this is some of the cultures. I'm not, I'm not actually joking. This is happening. And then they say, this is the amount of school fees we paid. This is the hospital fee when she was sick so many times. This is what we took her on holiday X amount of times. This is what we spent on her. Wallahi, they give you a list. And they tell you, right, you need to pay. $65,000 and you know what? We will give you 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. You continue paying your entire life. That's not a commodity. What, what Jannah do you want in return? You, you, you are getting cash. Wallahi, these are cultures. I've witnessed it in Africa as well. And even in other places, there are different cultures even more weird. You'll be surprised. When Islam says you honor 
a female. Daughters are special. Look after them. They will result in your entry into Jannah. Because you nurtured her, you spent on her, and you have the big heart to give her away for the right reasons. You don't give her away solely because it's the son of your friend. You don't give her away solely because, oh, I wanted to do this and that. That's a big businessman. If my daughter's married there, ooh, it's going to be good. <laughs> you make sure you concentrate on the deen, on the religion, the akhlaq. Don't make a mistake. Your child will be depressed in a wealthy home. And I'm not saying all wealthy homes are bad. So from amongst us, there may be people who are wealthy. But at the same time, what we need to know is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept certain rulings. And one of them is, when you want to marry, you need to be on a similar level of deen. If you're not, it won't go further. You won't, if you are married to someone, if you are married to someone who doesn't have a similar understanding of the deen as yours, it's going to be a very turbulent path. Remember that. This is why the hadith says, فَضْفَرْ بِذَاتِ deen." You want to marry? Become victorious by concentrating on the point of deen, the faith of the person. How serious are they regarding their link with their maker? That's what you need to look at. But at the same time, my mothers and sisters, when a man looks after or nurtures his daughters and gets them married and has borne the patience, he, he swallows, you know, they say, he bites the bullet, so to speak. He swallows the pill of letting her leave the home, yet she was most loved to him and go to someone else in a way that now she starts her own life. And he allows her to have a say in who she's going to get married to. Amazing. That's something important. He allows her. People think in Islam, she doesn't have a say. Wallahi, that is worse than the pagan times. Because we've come so far. How on earth could we be such that we say, no, this daughter doesn't have a say. She does have a say. She can refuse. That's what she does have. She can say, I don't want and she can ask you, she can suggest things. And if you don't have reason to refuse, you should not. You're not allowed to actually. You have no reason. And if you do without reason, she can divert that guardianship from you to someone else and continue with the marriage. May Allah forgive us. We become so, so narrow-minded in this regard at times. What Jannah, what paradise do you want? through your daughters if you haven't even looked after them. You haven't participated in their lives. You haven't even got them married to whom they wanted to marry. Obviously, unless you had solid grounds, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to strike a balance. I'm not giving a green light to children to say, just defy your parents. No, but it needs to be from the beginning, a decent understanding. We need to know what is required of you, what is it that your parents require from you, and what is required of you as parents. So this is when you earn Jannah, when you've taken good care of them. I told you I started off with marriage, and here I'm coming to the end, the issue of marriage as well. Daughters are so special that when a male marries a female, he is reminded constantly that who you have married is the special child of someone, dear to someone. So we tell the husbands that when you look at your wife, don't just look at her as your wife. That's not the only title she has. She had a title before that, which was more dear and more valuable. What was it? She is the daughter of so-and-so. She also has her own family that loves her and respects her. So do not disrespect her. Do not abuse her. Like they say, don't make her cry. You know, when my wife cries, I always tell her I'm supposed to, I'm not supposed to allow you to cry. She says, I cry out of joy. Mashallah. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's a good sign. So if you're crying out of joy and happiness, Alhamdulillah. But if you're crying out of, you know, sadness, you're stuck. There's no way forward. Wallahi, Allah has heard the cry of a wife and a daughter. If you take a look at Surah Al-Mujadalah, named after a woman who came through in order to 
present her case to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where the husband became disinterested in her. Listen to this, and I, inshallah, I will end on this note. I tell you, very interestingly, there was a woman known as Khawla binti Thalaba radiyallahu anha. So what happened to her is she was married, and mashallah. You know, a pretty beautiful woman, next thing, expecting she has a child. And when you have a child, what happens? Subhanallah, people forget that you've now born children. You've, you've graduated into a new level of, you know, motherhood now and so on. You will not be the same girl you used to be 20 years back. Things have to change. Perhaps you may change in so many ways. You become wiser and perhaps you may even become a little bit heavier. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. She complained because her husband started losing interest or showed disinterest. She, he was not interested. And he started saying whenever she was trying to get him, get his attention, he would say, you're just like my mother, man. It's okay. You know, you're just like a mother. You're just like my sister and so on. She went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa crying, weeping, complaining. What do I do? This man is saying this to me. He, he refuses to touch me. And at the same time, he is the one who impregnated me. He gave me the children. He is the one who did this, this, this. When I married him, I was in tip top shape and so on. My mothers and sisters, I just want to pause for a moment to tell you that that does not mean that when you have given birth, you should just lose yourself. No, go back. You will be able to retain a lot. If you work on it, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Whether they are sit-ups, leg-ups, whatever you want to call them, they work. <laughs> Trust me, they actually work dedicatedly. So don't use a hadith in order for you to throw yourself, you know, to the side. No, work on it. You will feel good by the will of Allah. Like I said, do it for the right reasons. Going back to this narration. So as she's complaining, do you know what happened? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Obviously, it's a difficult situation. What do you say? You need to convince the man. Verses were revealed. قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Indeed, Allah has heard the argument of the woman who has come to you complaining. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has heard it. And then he gives the response. And it's a long uh, set of verses where Allah speaks of the punishment of those who say those type of statements. And how special and important the woman is. You don't just say these words. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to make the correct decisions in life. May we be from amongst those who really worship Allah and Allah alone. May we be from among those who are special not only in the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala but in reality we need to lead our lives in a way that we can be considered special even by those around us what's the point of just going out and saying I'm special I'm special what's so special about you that's what people might say to be honest Live your life in such a beautiful way, the way you talk, the way you come across, your dedication to the deen, your fulfillment of your duties, your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your connection with the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It will be such that subhanallah, your character will show, your conduct will show in such a beautiful way, people will consider you special. They will miss you when you're not there. They will want to be in your company. That company needs to be free of gossip and backbiting and slander and bad words. Say good things about one another. And inshallah, you will achieve a lot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. These are a few words that I have actually uh, you know, chosen to say. But at the same time, I hope to be back later with a different topic. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Ah.